Ah, good. Right, we're going to talk about ZFS in the Postgres focus. Uh, yesterday I spoke in the more from the Linux and all the fun and the deep dive in there. Today I'm going to focus on how I deployed it on ZFS. So we have the introduction, we'll look at the ZFS and the pertinent Postgres related stuff. Then I'm going to show some real setups that I'm using, some closing advice, and then we can close and go, I mean, uh, go and implement ZFS. Right, where am I? I'm Indra Visage. I'm a freelance consultant. If you want some business cards, it's in front there. I did some previous large installations on Solaris with ZFS, and that's where I fell in love with ZFS. I'm currently administering Postgres for a couple of clients, and all my Postgres installations is only on ZFS. Right, first caveat, uh, quick question here. Who here or do not run their Postgres on Linux? Excuse me? All right, good. The only fun part of Linux is there's some issues with the open ZFS uh, licensing. So if that becomes an issue and the company, etc., and all those fun and games, you can always consider Solaris, the open Solaris derivatives, and FreeBSD. FreeBSD is stable in kernel. That is what I use at my home NAS and stuff. But my clients on, are all deployed on uh, Linux. Uh, so that's just something to be aware of. Everything I'm going to say here today is going to be a uh, uh, quick question. Uh, no, okay, the question there is quick install. It doesn't come standard with Debian. You need to add extra packages. It will never really be supported by Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, but Ubuntu do have its standard in. Uh, we, we can discuss those offline and so forth. But yeah, so it's Postgres. You can run Postgres on any of those also. If, if licensing is an issue, just be take, take that note from. What is ZFS? ZFS is a copy on the right, volume manager and file system. And it has some nice extras added to it. I'm just going to go through some pertinent parts that you need to be aware of and understand why it's needed or used in Postgres and why you want to configure it in certain ways for Postgres. The first one is the intent lock. It only locks synchronous writes to the ZOL, and that is things like when you write your wall logs, those things are done synchronously. It needs, the Postgres needs to know it's on disk. Those sort of things will get locked into the ZOL. It's not a cache, it's just a, it's quickly released after the data have been written out from the buffer to the real storage. You compare it like your wall logs. Your wall logs is the same thing. It writes to a certain part, then it commits it to the database, and only once it's committed to the database, it actually removes it from the wall logs. The S log, that is the part where you take that ZOL log, take it out of the main storage and put it on a separate device. It's small because it's only sort of every five seconds or ten seconds, depending on the configuration that you use, that you need to store. So it's not, uh, how can I put it, it's not big data. It's quickly released once it's written to storage. Uh, but you need to make sure, just as your wall logs, it's on a proper storage. Otherwise, you can lose the storage and your database with that. Something to note, your wall logs and your S log device you typically want to have on separate devices for the simple reason that the wall log, the information that's being intended to write into the wall log is being written to the S log, otherwise you're going to have a double write happening on that and actually you will then have a triple write on that because it will write to the S log, it will write to the wall log, it will write to the main storage eventually. Uh, so yes. So prevent that and just keep that sort of thing in mind. If you do want to move your wall logs, keep it different. The other thing is the adaptive replacement cache. Uh, it's been paper that you can go and read up. One of the things there, it might be more time consuming than the least recently used cache, 
but it's been found to be, on average, twice as better hit ratio than you have on your um, LRU. And it was briefly in Postgres. I think if you go read up on the Wikipedia on there, you'll see it was somewhere around uh, just before the Postgres 8. They had it in there, but when they, the issue of the patent became evident, they removed it out of Postgres. The big point there, it optimizes frequency and recent use. And the ZFS memory usage is tweaked in the arc. One thing you need to remember with ZFS, the ZFS buffers actually wants to make use of the uh, operating system buffer space to know how much it's there, because that's the way how it then optimizes its indexes and its reads and stuff. RAM, yes, the ARC loves to use RAM. The only Linux pertinent part is uh, if you use the Linux uh, ZFS on Linux, uh, any release before 0 0.7, there's some issues with there. So if you try to, and it actually happened with me several times, after a while you make some changes, you want to restart your Postgres. Postgres don't want to come up. There's enough RAMs available, but because of the fact that the ZFS, the way it used the RAM, Postgres could not allocate its uh, buffer and its shared memory. And then you need to either reboot the server or you can make use of the CTL drop caches to make the space available. And then Postgres happily starts up because it can allocate the RAM from the kernel. All right, as I said, Postgres relies on the OS buffers for caching, and that's the way you need to make sure the impact that this will have on your Postgres. The other important one is the L2 arc. That's only a secondary cache. It pointers to the L2 arc is keep in the RAM, in the arc space. Uh, from a Postgres perspective, you will use that when you have slow word devices where you store your actual data on. You then want to use this for a way to do secondary caching for uh, Postgres. And typically only for big stores. The way I've deployed my stuff at this point in time, the sizes of my database were such a nature that I couldn't have it all sit on SSD storage. The only other place where you'll find this sort of things is when you, or the need for it might arrive if you read your log files and your wall logs, oh, but it's not log files, backups, when you want to do that. But most of the time it's not that time critical, so. Performance advice. I'd rather have more RAM available for indexes to stay in ARC. The moment that the indexes grows too big for your ARC, or the used, used indexes, then you are going to have a problem where the, um, we have performance issues where it just dives into the ground. Uh, I might have the time, I'll make the time to see if we can show you the effect that has when those sort of things happen. Copy on the right. This is, well, actually I should have stated there, uh, it's the same way how Postgres work. Postgres is a multi, what is it, MVCC of, M, yeah, whatever. It's multi variance with it. Uh, you're going to, you do not write over the row or the new updated row, you write a new row and then you remove the pointers to the old row. So that sort of thing is already being done in here and that's sort of just nicely worked because you do not update really the old one, you just write a new part on it. So as you know, copy on the right, never overwrite, write to a new block and then update the pointers to the, what is it, to the new block. <coughs> Snapshots. Implementation is quite simple and we actually have it if you look at Postgres, the, what is it, the multivariant versions of it, uh, where you can have one version running with the other one until such time as you finished with the old query, then the pointers get removed. And this is the same that happens with your copy and write, but with the snapshots, we just keep those pointers there. This makes an interesting thing for point in time recovery where you use something, we do your snapshots with your, actually it should be PG underscore start underscore backup. You can do quick recoveries and do quick snapshot backups, hourly basis, and then if anything happens, you can then quickly roll back to that older version. Nice for risky updates, upgrades. If you want to do that, 
do the query. Once it's done, if it worked great, destroy the snapshot. If it doesn't work, roll back to the new or to the previous one. Keep an eye on the ZF pool free space, especially when you're doing a vacuum full. Remember, a vacuum full writes a total new copy of the database. So if you did this snapshot, you have the database, make a snapshot of it. After that vacuum full, you're going to have a full copy of that old database and you're using double your disk space. That's the one thing to be aware of in this whenever you use uh, snapshots with Postgres. And yes, it did bite me once. Compression. This is the biggest gain that you will find from using ZF, oh, what is it, Postgres on ZFS. You have the options. The default setting is uh, none. And then you have the quick uh, compressions. Enable the compression. It's fast. It's efficient. It works. I easily, on the one client, uh, something like one gigabyte per second reads from the two SSDs. And the SSDs were basically idleish. Uh, you get that type of performance out of it. Most of your data, well, the assumption there is you have more gigahertz than uh, IO data, right? Because you have that recently you have multiple core systems. So the more cores you have, the easier this is. Well, the easier this is to implement, the quicker it is. It's a no-brainer in the most of recent hardware. If you look at the log files, when you write out things for, like I'm using for PG Badger, we need to write out each and every query that goes through. And those sort of log files grew exponentially very quickly. We get a 7 to 10 percent compression ratio on those things. Postgres database, typical 3 percent, oh, it's a 3 to 1 uh, compression. SQL data dumps, about 7 times uh, compression ratio. And now the fun part is whenever you do that, you have a real time R sync differential of your SQL data, data dumps. So you do not have to decompress to be able to R sync or have any uh, R syncable settings to your compression. You just R sync over to the other side and you have it there. Compression. Well, the experience I say there, LZ4. It's good, fast, just enable it. It's a no-brainer on Postgres. GZIP, ignore that one until you have really a need for that extra 5 to 10% uh, compression to happen. One thing to remember, whenever you enable or change these settings, only the new data written gets applied. The old data stays on their old setting. In Postgres, that's a quick one to fix. You just do a vacuum full, and you'll have the new data compressed in uh, ZFS. All right. Any questions at this point in time? Yes, you can move the camera. All right. <clears throat> Let's show you my real setup. The first one there is a dedicated uh, hardware setup. About 210 gigs of actual data on disk, 70 gigs compressed. The indexes at one stage got too big for the RAM and the ARC, and the system just went downhill from there. We got them to the point where they actually started to archive the data that's relevant and only have reasonable time data that queries run on, and the system was immediately back to standard. There I have a DR replication to a different data center, and I use daily snapshots and backups to FTP storage. And that's where I started the first one for the detailed logs for PG Badger, and wrote that to a separate device. Typically, those are then run on uh, what is it? Those were run onto a separate uh, storage, which was the what is it? Uh, hard drive question there. Sorry, uh, it's actually back to that. Uh, the index has got too big for the RAM. 
do you have some kind of rule, the, the, the ratio that you'd like for the uh, database size? I know it's dependent on the size of the indexes, but do you have some kind of rule of thumb where you have this amount of RAM for this amount of DB space? Uh, no, I do not have a rule on that. It basically depends on the application. You have to look at that. This specific one have quite bad, uh, what is it, indexes in certain cases where we actually, uh, we were running sort of, you can say, really a 2 to 1. As a database size, half of that must be RAM. And that was because bad problematic indexes, the way the data is done in the back end. So they are busy fixing up that because they were using Mendex. It's not so much a problem with Mendex, but because it was a quick development quick there, they just run with that. Now that they are, the application is running and stable, they are busy tweaking and fixing up the SQL in that. So for example, what we found there is we changed uh, some of the stuff to partial indexes and immediately certain things just ran fast. For the worst case, would you, would you do it two to one, the database twice as large as the, the RAM? Or is that overkill? I will say this, uh, it depends. <laughs> you, you'll have to look, each database, each system, different, different issues. So, no, I'm not going to give a rule of thumb. It's just a matter of you need to keep an eye on certain of your parameters and stuff. Okay. Right, the compression, snapshot, and replication, that helped me recover that system when I mistakenly removed R minus R if the Postgres database directory. I actually removed the full database, 200 gigs of data. What I did was immediately Postgres went down, I got alerts and stuff, and stopped the database, stopped the replica, roll back to the days, uh, Snapshot, or sync from the replica back, and because it's only 60 gigs real storage, and only the diffs that was uh, with the R sync sync back, less than an hour the client was back up and running again. They still to do they do not know about it happening. Uh, let's quickly show you that setup. Right. Oh, right, that AquaCheck web part there, uh, that's other things that have that high compression ratio. If you look at the ZHDD, uh, come on. Right, so what happens here is you will see I have uh, hard drives there. That's four terabytes of hard drives. Those I have as a log onto that. Actually, in retrospect, I don't really need it, but it helps in especially the writing out of the logs. And that is the cache for those logs and typically also your PG Badger stuff that will be used the next day. That is the actual database. You can see that is the data size. Oh, okay, that's free. That's the actual size. Uh, there are two mirrors, and I had to add the second one as I did a vacuum full, and things uh, used too much space. So I needed that extra one, and that's the reason why that one has two in there. Uh, here is where I do my backups on this client. The postgres side of things. I put my Postgres in uh, backup mode. I issue a ZFS snapshot. Now, as we all know, once you've put your Postgres in a backup mode, it, started write, it starts writing out to a wall log. Only the wall log, it does not touch the actual data side of things. You can do that backup. Once you've done with that uh, backup, then you stop Postgres and you do a copy of your um, wall logs. Then you have at that point in time, through backup available for you. So that's why I do the ZFS snapshot, I do the stop backup, and I do a quick snapshot after that one. 
And after that, I go and copy in place from the one to the other one. Or actually there, I mount that clone. I clone the volume. I then copy from the one to the other one. And then I have a full one that I can then start to... Right, if you see there, I put the clones in uh, read-only mode. They're not getting auto-mounted. Those are making space on the FTP server that I'm copying my stuff to. And the reason I use that, because the FTP on the remote side where I do my backups does not have a compression ZFS, so I compress onto that one there. The reason I'm using LBZIP2 is simply because it's a parallelized BZIP2, so I can get performance out of that one. I unmount that clone. I let Deadman Snitch know that everything was fine. Some other space that I make, and then I run my application backup for there. That is the same thing I use with ZFS Snap at another client. So basically, that's run on an hourly basis. Put Postgres in backup mode, do the snapshot, take it out of backup mode, take a second snapshot, run like that. Actually, I do not do the second snapshot on that one there. Uh, yeah. So that's the one where I do my PG Badger stuff. The backups that I do from that snapshot that I dump onto that one there. From there, I then copy onto the FTP side. Uh, Below that one, well, actually there on the SSD is my actual database. You can see I only have really four disks in there, the SSDs and the tera four terabyte drives in that one there. The reason why I love these sort of things with uh, LZB backup is because we have six, 16 threads available, eight cores. The fun part that you'll see there is things like your... Um, uh, you'll see it pop up there, that TX stuff. That is that TGX, that is the part where it actually do the, what is it, the transaction group right out to disk. Yeah, as I say, that's sort of the compression ratios that we are looking at. The actual database, 3 to 1 compression, uh, PG Badger stuff, 5 to 1, and where the logs and stuff is, we have a 7 the one compression that's happening on that one there. All right, any questions on this part? My VM clients. Yeah, come on. You want it in there, and then I need to do this. All right. When we started off with them, we have about five gigabytes of data that we need to transfer in a year ago. They need long-term backups for financial reasons. The backups need to be local, DR, and offsite. So local, I do a PG dump. Uh, I'm using auto Postgres backup, and I modified that to disable any compression done by it. I'll show you now why. I have a DR that I did replicate to a different... Uh, data center. I actually run the same on there, just different times of the day. The one run before the batch runs, the other one run after the batch runs for the day. So I have two sets of backups for that client on different parts of the day. Then I use offsite using TarSnap. Now the nice thing about this, because of the deduplication, compression, and encryption, I use TarSnap. And I'll show you now why I use that. So let's have a look at this client setup. That is the daily SQL backup that's being done by Auto Postgres Backup for the day. As you will see there, if you do a word count on it, it's 26 gigs for the day. That's on a database. If you look at, okay, I'll get to that one now. Now, that's the compressions that we get for those backups: six to one, seven to one. PG logs, that's where I 
dump all those stuff that I will process in PG Badger. I do not run PG Badger on this client yet, but we're coming on that one. That's a 10 to 1 that we get on that one. Database, again, 3 to 1 uh, compression on the data there. Same type, just a different view. But here's the reason why I do not do the compression part with auto Postgres, because I can now, for a 26 gig dump for the day, only back up 9 megabytes for all of those data. That includes my yearly, my monthly, my weekly, my daily backups that I have for that client. All of them, that's 9 gigabytes for the past year's data that I have for them stored there on Tarsnap. 26 gig uh, dumps every day. I only have 9 gigs of data stored remotely. If you go look at our snap, the pricing on it, this sort of thing then becomes a no-brainer for this specific client and this type of backup. Do remember this one. All right, that's 10 minutes left. Any questions at this point in time? The other client uh, there, also in VMs, uh, also doing DR using replication. They were not in their sizing and stuff. They did not want to go for the tar snap thing yet. I'll get to them soon on that. The biggest backups they do for their system is using at the Proxmox sites, the VZ dumps there. So that is how we do most of our backups for that client at this point in time, other than the replication. But I then use ZFS snap for snapshot management at that client. And why? ZFS Snap, you created a name at start backup, end backup. The same things that I used on the previous one. Start of the backup, do the PG start backup, do the snapshot. What is it? End the backup, do the end of backup one there. What it does there, it gives me the name of the backup the timestamp of when that backup took place, and the TTL, a time to live. So what ZFS Snap do is when you run it, let's quickly see if I can find that uh, file. I forgot to grab that one. User local bin. Ah, there it is. So in my cron that I run, I give it this thing month, weekly, daily, hourly, and then just the one that is a TTL of one hour for when I do tests and those sort of things. And there you'll see the same that I use. Do the start backup. ZFS snap, that minus D will delete any old uh, backups for that name that is past the TTL date. Uh, the TTL is specified from there, if it's a year, six months, a month, a day, or just an hour. Do the stop backup, do the end backup, and that's that. Questions? So, my advice from experience? Use the default compression. It's a no-brainer. 3 to 1 compression, it's just, in my opinion, it's a no-brainer. Yes, there might be cases where it might give some problems, but most of the times, it's a no-brainer for most of your SQL databases. The type of data, the previous, the big one is IoT type data. The other one is financial data. This one has uh, post-guess type data in it tracks that's being kept in and people upload on a daily basis. What you want to do is you want to split your database and your logging backup data sets, and you typically want them on separate things, like your data, use it on SSD, and your hard drive for backups logging. 
when you do get to that point where performance becomes, high performance becomes a real issue, you will consider wall lock on a separate storage for high, high rights. All right, questions? Just wait a minute there for the mic. I think you need to press a button and it needs to be green and light and everything should be fine. Hello, yes. So, hypothetically, when you are writing to this file system, it just keeps on writing new into new, uh, it uses up the, the entire disk until, uh, unless you explicitly tell it to delete something. Do I understand that correctly? Or? No, right. Uh, the only time it will keep that data is when you add it as a snapshot. Then it will keep that data and until you destroy that snapshot. When you, uh, so it, it's like your wall logs. Your wall logs is not kept there indefinitely. It's only kept there for a while. Once it's been committed to the storage, then the wall lock is only there for historical reasons and it gets deleted as you go by time. Uh, unless you go and save those wall locks, then you will have that point time. So the only time it keeps that is if you do a snapshot. And that's the reason why uh, you want to delete it. That's what ZFS snap makes so nice because there you have a TTL and it will delete it for you. Uh, default TTL? No. It's, uh, that is, when you create that snapshot, it is right there. Uh, I might need to go back to another client for you to show you. I'm sorry for the cameraman, but the moving target is so much difficult to hit. Um, In this case, I have not yet implemented ZFA snap for this client yet. There, I actually have a script that deletes it after 35 days. And the script has a little bit of a bug in it that I matched on that part. So that's the reason why those are not being deleted. So yes, I still need to go and delete those, otherwise it's being kept. You can see the type of data it refers to and how much of the actual storage is being used there. So that's the data storage used by that. The reason that one is so small is because that's only the wall logs between the two uh, snapshots, between the PG start and the PG stops stuff. And that's sort of, you can see there, 10 gigs, 10 megs for that day, 10 megs for that day. And that's sort of a typical growth for this client of 10 megs of uh, compressed storage. So that's 30 megs a day of data that's being ingested in there. Right. Any other questions? All right. Other than this one, other questions so far? All okay, right. So that one there. Uh, I just want to find out regarding the freeing of the ZFS file system. For example, Postgres, you'd run a full vacuum to free your blocks, and you can reuse those blocks. Um, but for ZFS, does it work the same? So if I delete those snapshots, uh, do those blocks get freed, or do I have to do a manual thing, or is there maintenance that runs? Uh, how does that work? All right. Uh, no, there's no need for that type of maintenance. The moment that you destroy that snapshot, that data gets freed by the ZFS. The only thing that you need to remember on that, but that is for a sysadmin that's managing his VMs and stuff, you want, uh, ZFS does not issue FS trim commands, but that is not for a database admin to worry about. It frees those things on your behalf. The moment you destroy that uh, block, it will do it. So, Again, if we go back to that first, first slide on this issue. Um, right. So when it does that part, when there's no new pointers, point, when there's no pointers pointing to that block, then it just discards it and it sees it as a free block. The only time it keeps that uh, pointers is when you do a snapshot for that. Okay. There's another question there at the back. 
Hello. I'm just wondering if you have to have the data encrypted in the backups, um, how does that affect the compression ratios? And um, is, is that uh, recommendable or is that something that you would do or not? Um, the you do not want to encrypt data before you compress it. You always want to first compress, or you first want to deduplicate, then compress, then encrypt before you send out. And that's exactly how TarSnap works. It first does the um, deduplication, then it does the um, find the differences, or yes, find the differences, do a deduplication, then it does the compression. Uh, then it does the encryption and sends it off. So if you have data that's encrypted in your, oh, what is it, your database, then yes, it won't get compressed. Okay, but that's not part of ZFS, that's a separate product. Yes. Uh, ZFS and encryption is something that might be looked at, but you need to follow the open ZFS on that part. So no, ZFS do not have, at this point in time, uh, what is it, they call it uh, encryption at rest. Right. Thank you. Time is gone. Uh, thanks for the time and listening. And uh, if you want some business cards for me to help you, there's lots of them available.